Hi everyone, my name is Nhan, an undergrad student at Phu Bai University, Vietnam. I'm happy to represent Phu Bai students to talk with Mr. Thomas Valerie, the chairman of Phu Bai University, Vietnam, Board of Trustees, and the director of Vietnam program at Harvard University. Hi, Mr. Thomas Valerie, uh, nice to meet you. So our student here is really like interesting about the news that um, President Biden visited Vietnam. So. Um, and I heard I have heard a flex thing about you is that you are the middleman that make this happen. So can you please share a bit, little bit about your experience on this? Well, first of all, that's an exaggeration, right? That's an exaggeration. I, I, I was very, uh, I was very pleased that the two governments decided to have this historic visit. Right? So um, I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm knowledgeable about what uh, Vietnam was interested in, what the United States was interested in, but the, the actual trip takes place by the government, the government relationship. So universities, uh, people at universities don't have a lot to say about it, but we were quite supportive. And we, we understand the importance and significance of the, of the visit because we, one of the things we do at Fulbright and at Harvard is we study contemporary Vietnamese politics and the challenges that Vietnam faces in the 21st century. So we're, we're familiar with the challenges that Vietnam is facing. And so we're interested in the trip from the perspective of what, what might be coming and what might be new and what might be interesting for Vietnam and for, and for the US. Yes, I believe that um, the visit of the president is really like having a big impact on Vietnam and for our university as well. Um, so you, can you please share about your insight of how you think um, this visit can signify for Vietnam context? So I was uh, pleased that in the joint statement uh, by the two governments after the trip of, of uh, General Secretary Nguyen Phu Chap and uh, President Joe Biden, that Fulbright University of Vietnam played a prominent role in that. Uh, we are a small, small part of the educational ecosystem, but we're a different type of part of that system. And, and we're pleased that we were that we were recognized as uh, as an important growing in, in a university that might that might be able to uh, do some things a little bit different in the education community. So, how do you think that it will strengthen? Fulbright as an educational institution, and um, is this anything that uh, has been discussed about the opportunity for Fulbright in the future? Yeah, the trip itself is is not the there's no direct connection between the trip uh, and, and Fulbright, uh, except for the recognition that uh, education is an important an important part of what Vietnam's future uh, depends on. If, if there's going to be a, 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 a revisiting of Vietnam's industrial strategy through more technology in the system, more, more uh, supply chain security, uh, more high-end uh, interest in uh, technology companies, whether they're Vietnamese companies, foreign companies, or domestic private companies, that, that the education system of Vietnam, not, not just Fulbright, the whole ecosystem of Vietnam, has to create a more uh, well-trained person uh, to get Vietnam to the higher value in the, uh, in the sort of world technology apparatus. So, so whatever you do, whether it's a chip factory or, or, or building a mine of uh, rare earth materials or, uh, or thinking about upgrading your uh, telecommunications infrastructure, uh, cloud computing, whatever, you need an engineering uh, background and you need engineering e expertise that is, comes from uh, more from other parts of the world and other universities around the world than just being uh, Vietnamese uh, universities. So you have mentioned the role, the critical role of technology 
and um, like how Vietnamese have to adapt itself to um, to be with authors companies. Well, in light of this, we are excited to hear that Fulbright University Vietnam has partnered with New Turing Institute to establish an artificial intelligence um, institute in uh, Fulbright. So, how do you think that this initiative can be aligned with what um, the mission that um, uh, the country is heading to? Yeah, no, that's a terrific question, and for us, a, a terrific opportunity. Uh, I, I had the, the great pleasure of being at Fulbright University's uh, first graduation, and uh, I, I sat next to, or sat nearby, the commencement speaker there, who was a, a, one of my, uh, uh, serves on the board of trustees with me. Dr. Lady Cook, who's uh, one of the founders of Google uh, Google Brain, which is now called Google DeepMind. Dr. Cook and others at uh, Fulbright at the Google Google uh, Brain have been helping Fulbright over the past almost decade design or pushing us to design an engineering program that was driven first and foremost by artificial intelligence. When they first proposed this to us, I, I, thought, I thought, oh, they're, they're crazy. You know, they're, it's a bridge too far, this and whatever. But then after the, the release of uh, ChatGPT and um, BARD and some other platforms, uh, we, we wanted to revisit that idea that uh, finding a, a central way for Fulbright through, through a major or something like that, we, we can't automatically be uh, in the world-class business of, of AI, but we can certainly use the sort of our relationship to the very prominent Vietnamese uh, scientists who both created modern AI and still teach modern AI. We can we can we can create a mechanism to do that. The the new Turing Institute is a nonprofit uh, organization in Vietnam that was incubated by them, incubated by what's now you know the team at Google DeepMind. And so they worked with themselves and uh, they wanted to partner with a university that had a, a, a curriculum that was a little, a little bit more full-time and a little deeper way to, uh, to hire AI talent around the world to bring to Fulbright. Now when we bring it to Fulbright, we don't just want it to be for 60 students. We, we want it to have some of an open source. So what the new Turing Institute does for us, it allows us to take what we're teaching here and then bring that open source AI teaching to lots of people like, so that you could go online and learn X, Y, or Z. So it's, a, it's an open source idea. It's not just in the Fulbright classroom. It, it, once you get into the, open, uh, into the new Turing Institute, they spread it around you know, in different places. So that, that's the value. So yesterday you have shared a story of um, how you see the story of Oppenheimer um, relate to the intersection between liberal arts and, and technology. So could you please share this game sure. with the audience? Sure, no, it's very, I, I love the uh, interaction yesterday with your Fulbright students and, uh, and it was, uh, love was great. I, I really enjoyed it and just one of the one of the questions I got was uh, when I was talking about uh, AI and new touring and, and one of the students asked me a question. Uh, well, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to say we're a liberal arts university, but you're talking about AI and science. What's the connection between AI and the liberal arts? Oh, well, that was basically the question. And basically I said, who in the room has seen the movie Oppenheimer? And I was using the new movie by, uh, the new movie that's uh, playing in Saigon here, uh, that's uh, about, uh, about Oppenheimer as a, an example of the blending of science and, and the liberal arts. So in the movie, in the, in the life, right, the, uh, a, an American general uh, selects a scientist in the United States to run the lab at Los Alamos, which figures out how to split the atom and to create a new one. So the general that's searching for one goes to all the 
physics departments uh, and in the world and is trying to find, uh, I want to find a Nobel Prize winner. I want to find a Nobel Prize winner to come and let the experiment in uh, Los Alamos uh, be conducted by someone who has a Nobel Prize. But the general is smart enough to say, I don't need the guy with a Nobel Prize. I need a scientist who knows how to do it. And this, 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 the reason I, I think, and I don't know the whole story, but from what I take from the movie and what I've learned since, is that Oppenheimer is unique because he knows two things. He knows the other science, and he knows the liberal arts. So in the movie, it's clear that he knows He's familiar with the greatest poet, well, the greatest or almost great, or one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, T.S. Eliot. And T.S. Eliot writes a poem at the end of World War I about the disaster of World War I. And that disaster is in this, this poem called The Wasteland. So the general sees, oh, Oppenheimer knows about the science. But he also knows about what happened in World War I through this great poem, The Wasteland. It's also pretty clear in the movie that Oppenheimer also knows about Picasso. So it isn't that he just knows about black holes and things like that. He knows about other things. And those other things make Oppenheimer a, a personality that can keep the, the scientists together to to keep it on track and to uh, and to get it to work and to communicate it to the science community and to the world and to the American political world. That's why you need. That's why it's a connection between the liberal arts. That's why Oppenheimer is a good way to think about the liberal arts and science. Thank you so much for your sharing. I believe that through your answer, we have learned a lot about how liberal arts are and like how is this relate to the technologies. So with that, I would like to end the interview with Mr. Thomas Valley today. And thank you for listening. 